We have a new stage setting today. I hope you appreciate its beauty. I'd like to make a little announcement this morning. Uh, about 40 years ago, uh, my wife and her sister came out to California to attend our activities. As soon after they arrived, they translated the German manuscript of the Doma, which was later published under the Rosicrucis Codex. It's been very successful and in print continuously since its issue. There is a request that there be a thought of kindness sent to Martha, the sister who is now on her deathbed, asking for a happy transition into the other life. We will appreciate any good thoughts that you send in her direction. Thank you very much. Today, we have a very interesting subject that as far as I know, very, people, very few people seem to have done anything about. And that is the origin and significance of the home and its place in the esoteric tradition. There are many things about life we know very little about and this is one of them. So we're going to start home uh, as it began in the recorded history of our planet. Home was in the beginning a cave or a ledge on the side of a hill or cliff with some overhang to protect from the rain and uh, in this were huddled three persons a man, a woman and a child. They had no clothing except hair. They had no diet except nuts and such fruits as they could pick up. This was the beginning of what we call home. Well that's quite a long gap for most of us in our thinking, although there are spots on the earth today, unfortunately, that are not too far above this level. But home began as a part of a universal plan. The human being didn't create the idea of a home. He received it along with other gifts from the intuitional boundaries of his spiritual nature. He came here to learn certain things, and in order to learn them, he had to set up an establishment here to study, to understand, to share, and to bestow. And this was the beginning of what we call home. Now home is not merely a place nor a term. Home is a psychic integration. It is a real thing. A home is an alive thing. It is alive with the traditions, with all the backgrounds and all the wonders that have come down through homes to the present time. Not only that, but a home is an entity capable of creating karmic consequences. Any individual in a home is responsible for certain laws which were not created by man, but were created by the archetype which gave us home in the first place. Another home is a degree of consciousness. It is an unfoldment of principles. It is a revelation of purposes. It is something that happens as we unfold and evolve, by means of which we gain greater insights and greater opportunities for growth. So in this beginning, in this cave on the side of the hill, we have the beginning of a relationship between living things. At the moment relationships exist, there are consequences. There no relationship can be completely neutral. It always has to be for good or for bad, for better or for worse. So as we go along in this first little spectacle that we're talking about, we find going through age after age that the next thing we may notice is that this cliff home has been moved to a cave that has been discovered. A cave which was more protective and also uh, larger and more suitable for the exp expansion of the family. In this cave also we find the beginning of various interests and attitudes. The beginning the life consisted largely of simply eating available foods. But as things grew and unfolded, the new food became available, either through hunting, or fishing, or through watching the actions of various creatures in nature, eggs and all this type of thing. So gradually another step was taken. A step was taken in which the individual became aware 
of ways of building a stronger home situation that is possible to build a permanent relationship between nature and himself. This went on and on and on until somebody had the bright idea of hunting. And in the hunting came this t first the stone club and later the bow and arrow and still later the spear. Now these three were largely intended to help the individual uh, to find food in a world where most food was savage and afraid and, da and dangerous. But after a little while something happened that wasn't really in the book. The, the, the weapon became a means of dominating another human being. The individual was capable of destroying a life like his own. He was capable of planning and plotting to take over a bigger cave or a nicer hillside. Through the uh, development of this no notion of hunting came therefore his ability to hunt his own kind. Now the moment that he did this, he broke a law. Because somewhere in the background where deity abides in perfect radiance, there was a law that the individual was not supposed to hurt his neighbor. But in the development of his various ambitions, it became very desirable for this man living in the cave to get a better cave, perhaps a cave belonging to a neighbor. The neighbor was weak or old, so it was possible to get rid of him. And so now comes karma. Every action that the individual makes in his environment is subject to law. And this law is subject to the realization that all energy, all power, all strength, and all wisdom must be used for good. And if they are not so employed, they come back with very difficult and dangerous reactions. So the individual finally discovers that he is capable of using the knowledge that he has to build stronger weapons a stronger house and to dominate weaker or less thoughtful beings around him. So little by little there came into a realization and into fact a com competition of homes. A home was no longer your abode, no longer your place of safety. It was only safe if you defended it and it was only safe if it was strong enough to be defended. And so out of the simple idea of living together in peace and harmony came the idea of strong overcoming weak, weak becoming enslaved, weak becoming exterminated in the cause of, com of competition. So in the little story of the Stone Age man, we find him gradually developing into a chieftain, into the head of a clan. And this clan is a family. And the uh, uh, story goes on to identify the family with a clan or a group of people. Now in the doing of this we find that the more powerful the clan became the more separate it became from other clans. The stronger the clan the greater the, domination, the determination to use it to dominate other clans. And first thing we know, we had the foundations and beginnings of revolution and war. Now, this wasn't part of nature's plan. Nature didn't plan this. This was strictly and definitely a reaction of the human being. And this human being was under a pressure, the pressure of opportunity, the pressure of immediate gratification. And this brings into focus another early primitive reaction of the evolving creature. One of the things we notice about people is that most of them are in a hurry. They don't, some of them are pretty lazy, but a good many are in a hurry. And the ones who are ambitious are very much in a hurry. Ambition is something that you don't wait for. It's something you do something about right now. So out of the struggle between various factions and so forth, in this family relationship, we find ambition coming in. Ambition for leadership. Ambition for control of the resources. We find that in the course of time, all these little clans and so forth have worked together to produce something very interesting. 
And as a basis for comparison, we'll go right here to our own United States and we'll find what the American Indians were doing at that time. Somewhere in this course of, of, of an unfoldment and development, they were growing also. They were creating their tribal clans. They were beginning to create min miniature nations. And nations are just a mass of these clans. The individual was part of a family pattern. Now the, the uh, missions and the Pueblos of the Southwest uh, are quite interesting in a certain particular. Somewhere along the lines, these Indians became afraid of intermarriage. They didn't want to take a chance. Something happened. In intermarriage, they made a discovery. They were in trouble. Now, no one told them this. The Mosaic Law didn't influence them. They didn't know it existed. They didn't have any communication in language with anything except a few neighboring tribes. They were not uh, a, a separate. They were simply one experiencing something. So, gradually, it became a law of these people that in, manner, in marriage, you had to marry across the, the various Pueblos. You could not marry a person born in the same Pueblo as yourself. Now, this was proven again and again, and so to this 20th century and to now, among these Indians, they must marry across the Pueblos so that they do not have intermarriage. Now, why don't they have intermarriage? Because somewhere along the line, they found it wouldn't work. They found that there are certain penalties for it. Now, these penalties didn't prevent them from trying to do it, but it made so many consequences that they didn't like that they finally made laws to prohibit it. And nearly all the Indian tribes have such laws. Now, in another phase of the same problem, we have a, a tribe set up, as would be now, an Indian tribe in the eastern part of the United States. Here we might have one of the nations of the Iroquois League, uh, which is still active in Canada. The uh, problem is that these people, having created a pattern to live by, set up a government. Now, you know, setting up a government is quite a job. We're having trouble with it right now. We don't know how to set up the government. We've had one for a couple of hundred years, and it's sagging badly. And we don't even know what's wrong with it. We haven't thought of what's wrong. We've thought of pushing it to the continuance of itself, usually for ambition or avarice. But the Indian, being subtle and more or less to our mind, simple-minded, uh, has another way of looking at it. So what did he begin to do? He began to investigate the causes of the troubles between the tribes. And he began to realize that the main cause of trouble for all these different tribes was a poor leadership. And if you really wanted a stupid leadership, ah, oh, this is very technical. All you had to do was put men in. <laughs> so the Iroquois League said, we, we can't really afford to dispose of men. They're, you know, they're, they're colorful, but we can't let them rule because they are not the type that can rule. The ruler of the tribe must be the mother of the people. The mother has the first choice. She must lead the life that is to wake, make possible the happiness, peace, security, and growth of her child. The mother's intimate relationship with the future is benign, benevolent, and very gentle. Therefore, she wanted to know that the various generations that would follow would be kind. And uh, when Woodrow Wilson found the League of the Iroquois Nations, he was so delighted with it that he created out it out of it the League of Nations, which was never accepted, however, by this country. Nearly all other countries were glad to see it. Therefore, without accepting it, we did not have the benefits. But the uh, Iroquois League and the ladies of the tribe were working to create a system that would work, a system that would not be subject forever to the ambition of men. Because men were kind of more ambitious. They liked to go out and have a good scrap every once in a while. They liked to go out and take over something. They liked to compete with each other if it was only in baseball or football. They were kind of competitive. But the women of the tribe had a different point of view. 
So finally, in the great league, the whole private matter was moved out and made to the work all right. The senators of the Iroquois League, what we would call Congress, were called sachems. And the sachems were the number one men of groups of all kinds, representing different families or different groups of the Iroquois nation. So they became the representatives at the great meetings of the long table where all the problems of the tribes and everything involving the future of the Indians was worked on and cleared up and arguments and dissensions were arbitrated and everything went along very, very much better. So with the senators sitting in their feathered hats, uh, running everything, and the mother sitting back looking benignly at everything. There was a very nice type of government which unfortunately we disturbed by coming in and taking over the country. But in the meantime, we got a very interesting picture. The senators were men. Therefore, it looked as though we had the same old thing over again. But there was a difference. <coughs> the difference was that the senators were voted into office. That's the we vote our public officials. But no man could vote. All of the men had to be elected by women. <laughs> women alone had the vote. But they appointed their officials to do what was necessary. They didn't go out and do it themselves because they had families to take care of. Therefore, they created, uh, you will say, a system. The pol politics of the nation of the Iroquois was handled by secondary, secondary uh, leaders. The primary leaders were the women taking care of the children. Why? Because the League was very certain in its results. Namely, that the survival of the League entirely depended upon one thing, the integrity of the children. Without honest children, there could be no survival of civilization. The Indians decided on that 250 years ago. Nobody paid any attention to them because it looked so different from what we were accustomed to. But at the same time, as we look back from now, we're beginning to see that something interesting was happening. A new concept of life. These people were coming down from the caves now, from the Stone Age, into the villages and communities of the western half of the United States. And here, they created their own world. They created a kind of development based upon one thing, that it was absolutely necessary for the various groups to work together. Any individual who did not work for the common good was a detriment to the common good. And yet, with an ordinary way of doing things, if you refused a man a vote, he'd turn around and shoot you or to get rid of you in one type or another. But this wasn't any use if this voting was so developed and so handled that the women continued to vote and voted out the man who wanted to destroy them. So little by little, they got to a very good height. And the work done by Daganawida, the great sachem of the Iroquois, was carried on by the early colonists. William Penn knew about them. He knew exactly about them. And uh, on one occasion, he describes the fact that by means of this league, half of the continent of the United States was brought together without a shot or a bow or an arrow. It was done on the basis of integrity. And when the Hesachians were invited to England, some of them, to the court of the King and Queen of England, it was reported of them later that they were the most honorable people that the British had ever seen. They were correct in their thinking. But they were not just correct in their thinking because that was best. They had another reason. The correct thinking was according to the will of the great Manado. The correct thinking was according to the will of God. And the old sages in their meditation and the reading and writing and studying and listening to the stories of the old waves and their braves came to the conclusion that one of the ways to find out what God wants is to seek out and study what happens to people who do things. 
the moment an individual does something that ultimately hurts him or ultimately is in, in danger to another is wrong regardless of the motives it is only when all motives are essential and right that peace can exist in the land you cannot reform an individual who does not want to be reformed but you can place a government over him that is very strong and powerful and they did this when they created the great league and called the great league of the peace the one roof over all men and it was a great and great and wonderful success for many years until it was gradually destroyed by the ambition of the white people but in this also we find something else that's interesting and when the sachems met in parliament you can compare their parliament with what you hear and see in foreign governments in our own in these days when the time came for the government of the Iroquois to come into empiric session to make some major decision which was to affect all the people it was then strongly pointed out that any individual who advanced a subject for discussion who expressed a, a need for help in some way his remarks and his uh, findings were carefully recorded but this whoever presented the bill could not vote on it himself the bill had to be voted on on others therefore no sachem could advance any law or any recommendation that affected his health or added one cent to his wealth or one step to his attainments he, he could not vote he could advance however and discuss the need of the subject he decided on but it was up to the others to decide whether to take it or not he could not take the step of voting on his own decision now another interesting thing about them was that when the great league was open the place was a chapel everything was done with due consideration for the presence of a universal law which could not be violated anyone who tried to violate it destroyed himself and no man was necessarily destroyed by another man virtue survived vice died of its own weakness and all these different values were given proper consideration now in the meeting of the league one thing was also very noticeable no one in the league when speaking among the masters or the sachem uh, was allowed to say anything detrimental disagreement anything sad or unreasonable about anyone else there could be no attack by one senator upon another this was completely outlawed he, he only if the various factors were brought into focus then the various senators were able to discuss it themselves but no one was permitted to attack another he could accept or reject the rulings but he could not attack the personality involved and it did very little anyway if he had because he could be outlawed in 24 hours by the old lady sitting at home <laughs> so the set, all in all it has been assessed that the league was a great success as long as it lasted and it is probable that it was destroyed finally largely by non-Indians who didn't like the idea of the great white cloth of the peace or the one roof over all houses one family now another point of the league was very good that we might think about today and that is the one family the world as it looks today is made up of hundreds of families tied up in all kinds of leagues and treaties and everything you can think of but to the Iroquois people and to many others of this type of thinking there is only one family on earth the human family this human family is entitled to all the help and protection that it can receive this family is not to be exploited we're not going to allow an older brother to take away the money of the younger brother we are not going to go to war against some other country because a nephew wants to 
everything that is destructive within a family is, will ultimately destroy the complete family. Any treason within the group itself will ultimately bring the group to oblivion. So every effort must be made to see that the family is kept in proper order. Now we can trip over to China for a minute. Not the China of today, which has forgotten all these things, but the China of the days when it was the most powerful nation in the world without war. China has a perfect record, reputation, reputation for never really winning a war. They did not, left us nothing but a mass of defeats. But anyway, in the pattern, the Chinese said that the empire is a family. The empire is a family, one family. They all, everyone, is related to everyone else by brotherhood or sisterhood or parenthood. There is no such a thing as various nations uh, having feuds together or against each other. If they do, it is against the family. The moment a, a false deed is performed, the whole empire shudders because it is though a son betrayed his father or a mother neglected her child. Everything that was necessary to the perpetuation of good in human society must be defended by human society, must be made practical and workable by the efforts of people. And it would be the same thing as treason to have this dislocation of the family. Well, our world family now has probably nearly 200 nations in it. Any squabbling between any of those two nations is against survival. Every war is, a war is a step toward disintegration. There is no possible way of transforming an evil act into a substantial contribution to progress. So here we have wars all over and people all over talking about them. But... Uh, there are reasons why nothing happens. Because to do what is necessary, we must interfere with the private right of the individual to do what is wrong. It is no longer a problem as to whether he should or shouldn't. The time has come in these problems when it is he must or must not act as he does today. So in the uh, family cycle, as it was originally in China, the living ancestors, the elders, were virtually the rulers. Not because they were always right, but because no individual who is raised in a family and who has been suckled by a mother or has been educated by a father can possibly forget that eternal debt. All that we are is determined by our ancestry. And when the ancestry does not, is not worthy of this recognition, then the nation is already slipping. A nation must not uh, ever forget that it owes a great deal to the fundamentals upon which it was founded. This uh, nation owes a great deal to the 17th and 18th centuries of Europe for its foundations. It owes most everything that it is to the past. So the Chinese honored the grandparents and honored the ancients because of their continuous effect upon our lives. Now how do we know a good ancient from a bad ancient? That's not difficult. A good ancient is one who has said something maybe 200 years ago that is still true. A bad ancient is one who said something 200 years ago and 50 years later it was not true. After the, all, therefore, is to study and understand the integrities of the various contributing factors. Then comes along the older children and the selection of the new leaders and the younger children and their education. And uh, incidentally, they had a very good medical side of that philosophy also. The Chinese are one of the great ancestors of medicine and their scientific knowledge in the healing arts is prodigious. And they had a very simple code. Every family hired a physician. 
every respectable family paid a certain amount a year for a doctor. It was on for a life basis. And every time anyone was sick, the doctor's pay stopped. <laughs> that did it. No one wanted to have, the doctor didn't want to have his pay cut off. So instead of curing the sick, the Chinese said, prevent the sick. Now, we should probably say that's impossible. But the idea is right. And it could be possible if various personal ambitions and personal selfishness did not intervene. So we go on down through all these steps and we find this family that we left in a cave has gradually, really emerged into a member of our economic industrial society. Now we have a society that is reaping karma. Now in the old way days of sacred writing, if you disobeyed the gods, you suffered. And now we don't think of that so much. But we have to face the fact that if we disobey certain universal realities, we are in trouble. And we have to do something about it or we won't get out of trouble. So instead of thinking these uh, laws to come from people, most ancients decided that these laws came from space. They came from the integrities at the foundation of life. The same life that created worlds put laws to govern it. The same life that made nations has established rules by which these nations must be governed. And just as the health of the human body depends upon keeping the laws of health, so the health of a nation depends upon its integrities. There is simply no possibility of doing it badly and resulting in a happy condition. There has to be rules. And now after a considerable amount of warfare, rape and pillage, we're beginning to realize this. But now comes along some ultra-modern and tells us to forget all about the ancients. Oh, they lived long ago when everything was superstition. You can't depend upon them any longer. You can't depend upon what Aristotle said, or Confucius, or Lao Tzu. In fact, you can't even understand what some of them said. But the fact remains that many of them said things that have to live, or we are in serious and endangered condition. We have to recognize that we have as a source, as Bacon points out, uh, the value of tradition, the value of things that have been done before, which prove by their consequences what happens when you do those things. Now one of the outstanding examples of this point is war. Can anyone point out anyone or anything that ever actually resulted from war that was worth having? War is a possible way of endangering yourself and others. But it doesn't make any difference whose war you fight or whether you have a victory in arms or not. In a little while, the war will be in the dust. The, way, the great warrior will sleep with the ages and no one will care except to wish he had never lived. So all these things can be seen and traced and understood if we want to do it. Now we go back to the family. Here the family of today is coming into existence. What is the difficulty, the primary difficulty? Well, it seems to me, at least seems to be some classification in this direction, that the main trouble with family today is that there isn't any. Now what we call a family is some kind of a house with many doors and windows from which people are going in and out but nobody is staying. <laughs> we want to have, for the younger people especially, want to go out and start their own world. Why? Because primarily they want the right to do wrong. Now most of those people of all ages who want to get away from the control of family do so because they are doing something they believe the family would not approve of. Now there are exceptions to this rule, I know, but a great many are seeking what they call freedom. And what do they find at the end of the road? Narcotics, alcoholism, tobacco, and moral delinquency. This is why they want to get away, because they have lost track of the reason for being away. When a person wishes to be on their own, 
so that they can grow, so that they can do things that might not meet with the family approval, but which are still in the highest orders of integrity. These people may and could have a right to individual existence. But wherever an escape is simply to get away from tradition, from, from integrities, from honesty and honor, and slip into this strange world of fantasies from which we are now suffering, this in itself is very bad for all concerned. Now if we like to think of the home or the whole idea of home, something as a human body, we realize that the body can get sick. And we realize that the sickness of the body is largely due uh, to the sickness of the managers of the body, the mind, the emotions, habits, and the various acquisitiveness which we are all so inclined to. We have a sick world today. What are we trying to do with it? We want to be left alone so that we can do as we please. And this brings another point of great importance into, into focus, and that is immediacy. Now, between the average person and his own maturity is this concept of immediacy. By that we mean that everyone wants what he wants as quickly as possible. He doesn't want to earn anything. He wants to have it fall in his lap. He would much rather take a chance on winning a lottery than work at a job. He wants to have the immediate compensation for everything that is the fulfillment of his desires. And he also wants to be free from any punishment for the things that he does that are wrong. Now this immediacy problem <coughs> has been worked out with narcotics. Narcotics to the average youngster starting in on it is simply a way to be six or eight feet tall in half an hour. All of a sudden the dope addict is a great person. He has not become a tiny bit better than he was before. But he thinks he's better. He feels better. And if he keeps on feeling long enough, he will die. He will become a hopeless slave to his own desire to feel good without earning it. He has no desire to live a good life, but he wants to have the benefits of a good life. Well, that's not possible. And the life that he gets from what he does is not a good life and never was. It is a fantasy and an illusion. So we watch now the little man and his children coming out of the cave and going down now to about six or eight thousand years of evolution. Uh, this little man coming out of the cave was in the beginning not a bad chap. He was just looking for some way to survive. But gradually there rose within him his ambition. There arose within him the belief or desire that he could possess part of the world in which he lives. He forgot entirely the good words of scriptures that would remind him that all things belong to God, and that man doesn't finally own anything. He wanted to take over the mortgages and run the world. So he has produced a series of consequences that have really brought him up. He now lives in a better house. He now lives in, uh, with a more congenial group of uh, neo neurotics. He has all the things that he thought he wanted, a good car, a good job for a moment, an imminent danger of being destroyed by nuclear weapons. From the cave to the nuclear bomb is the story of mankind. Why? Because somewhere along the line, the human being lost touch with reality. He lost touch with reality when he lost touch with honor, when he lost touch with realities of the daily living, when he was no longer thoughtful of other people, when he was no longer interested in fair dealing. He became, he became more and more corrupt, and out of his corruption he created corruption. And almost all the problems of our economics that are now worrying us are the result of corruptions, the misuse of things. So we have to go right back to the whole of and realize that we are now living out what we have done to a good world. We have determined to destroy it because we thought by so doing that we could make it a source of unique advantage to us. It wasn't necessarily going to help anybody else, 
But he might help a small group of friends, but it was not the great good that was hoped for. So somewhere along the line, we go back to the world mother. We go back to the mother of God. We go back to the idea of the eternal mother of all that lives, which was found in so many of the teachings of the ancients. And as a rather hurt, crushed, disillusioned race of children, we are now asking a little bit for parental help. We want to know what to do to reclaim the honor we have lost. We want to know what we can do to perpetuate the values that survive. We want to know how we can make the planet last as long as possible and not gradually disappear because of nothing but stupidity. Well, if you take that to a mother who is a good mother, she might point out to you that all these problems resulted when you decided to leave her and go out on your own. That was the big mistake. You didn't need her any longer. You didn't need temperate things, honor, honesty, virtue, integrity. What you needed was strength and skill, and with these you would create a way for yourself. And everyone who has created a way for himself that way has created a way that led directly to the graveyard. So we have find the great mother of mysteries, Diana, the great goddess of the Ephesians, reminding the peoples of long ago and those of today of the virtue of the family that we can never solve these problems until there is no longer animosity or antagonism between the children we, do, we are not going to succeed if we fix it so that the eldest son gets most of the money we will not fix it if the eldest son works it so that he takes the rest of the money all these things are the foolishness and fallacies of ignorance. Over it all is the real spirit of the mother. The mother that wants us to share equally, share that honestly, and work together for the common good. The good mother is also hard to find these days because she is under pressures of all kinds. She has been taught or made to believe that her own position must be protected. The protector of mothers should be the sons but we know that it is not so now so we see all around the world nations who have, which have lost contact with the great stream of purpose now how can they find this stream of purpose and here I think is practically a cabal that we should all be thinking about that there is a way to know exactly what we should be doing we do not have to wait for a psychic to tell us. We do not have to wait for a dozen logicians to work it out in mathematics. The simple fact is that if we create a situation that helps a few and hurts many, that situation must be changed. There is no way it can ever be justified. And with the earth and its bounties, we have inherited the labors of the steward. We must protect this earth. We must keep the family. We must make it possible for the family to go on in life and in peace and in security. We also must allow that for all the children of all these different nations and races to realize that they are children of one eternal mother, the earth itself, and the heavens above the earth. There is no reason why peace cannot come but it will not come unless we value it more than we value avarice and selfishness we cannot have peace until it is more valuable to make a friend than to nurse an enemy all things that happen are in written form and the ancients have left us the records and they're in the rocks and they're on clay and on papyrus and paper and now they're in telephone all of these records tell us what happens to people who do it wrong. We don't know, we don't even want to read it. We do not want to do anything that stands between us and the immediate fulfillment of whatever we most desire. If we want wealth, any law that limits wealth must be removed. If we want happiness, all the causes of misery must be stopped. There must be no interference 
with the infinite desire of the individual to do exactly as he pleases. And for this sin fell the angels, according to the scriptures. The uh, actual point of it is that somewhere along the line, we have to learn how to survive. And we have to learn how to live in order not to destroy the beautiful world that was part of us. We've got to keep the garden free of the words, of the weeds, of selfishness, of, of ignorance, of hate, to injustice, thoughtlessness. We have to forget for a while what we want or why we want it. And we've got to work together for that which is the greater good to all. And this was written in the philosophies and teachings of practically all of the great leaders of the world. The great codes are identical. And because they demand integrity, they are neatly forgotten. Looking today around, we find several religions that have gone through very serious uh, evils together. These religions no longer representing the principles. The, re the religions were carefully altered to permit a brigandry, bribery, treason because these are the things that got the thing we want but also they got the thing that will destroy us so as we start out let's think of a family a close family will make a contribution to society that will go on year after year and generation after generation the children of a good family become the parents of new families out of the foundations that we make now from the consequences of tomorrow. If these families composed of individuals who only see each other on rare occasions and spend most of their free time in front of a television, we might as well check the thing off immediately. We are in serious trouble and we're not likely to correct it. But nature steps in at this time and also adds something. Nature gradually makes our mistakes so uncomfortable that we have to do something about them. We just can't stand it. We don't mind hurting other people, but we don't like to be hurt ourselves. And little by little, the fact that we cannot survive our own mistakes must take over. As it takes over, we do not have to look out into the unknown for the answers. The idea that there is no one who knows what to do is purely arbitrary. We all know what to do, because we all know what has failed. And we all know that we have tried it. We do know that the only things that can succeed finally are constructive things, not destructive. So out of the past, we have all kinds of families. <laughs> the families of the Middle Ages, and families of the uh, countryside, and families of the mountains and valleys. We have every race and every color, seeking for comfort, peace, and security. And we have not yet reached the point where we can provide this for them. The leader in a nation, the leading nation in a world, must be leading in the direction of solutions, not in the direction of complicating the issues involved. It is our solemn and natural duty as a leading nation of the earth to make sure that the earth becomes safe for everyone on it. It is not possible to have a happy world in which a few powerful nations make all the rules. The only uh, excuse for a powerful nation uh, was the excuse of the Spartans in Greece, in Sparta. The only reason for a strong nation is to provide the necessary rules and laws to make each of the citizens stronger. Any system that weakens the citizens to strengthen the leaders is leading into more trouble. Everywhere we see the trouble. And we realize that in a mysterious way, it is due to this family of ours. <clears throat> this family that has come down to us. We are all one type of life, living on one little ball in space. And this little ball is getting smaller all the time. And our natural resources are dwindling. And we are in constant danger of exterminating ourselves. Now, a native in the animal kingdom, for instance, reproduction in the, in the mating season is limited. And in, the, well, in those kingdoms, 
NASA takes over and protects. We haven't got the wit to do it. We haven't the wit to realize that our overpopulation problem, like many others, is the simple result of the individual having no standards of integrity of his own. He has no realization of right, no understanding of what is proper and what is safe. He just don't know what it does, what now. He wants to do exactly as he pleases, and the devil takes behind the most. Well, it's now as though the devil is catching up behind the most, and he's becoming more and more a real problem in our lives. So it is necessary for us to make necessary changes in order that we can understand these things. I think if we should do what the ancient Hindus did, it might help us a little. We could make a drawing or a diagram of a family. And we would look at that diagram of that family, and we would see all the branches and so forth. I saw in uh, Varoda, in India, once, a wonderful diagram. It was a wall covering about three feet wide, six feet long. And on it was a strange tree-like design with hundreds and thousands of tiny little marks on them. And these marks were all symbols of tribes, symbols of worlds, symbols of deities, and symbols of the meditational teaching that had come down from the earth. These diagrams made a complete history of life and proved conclusively to those who were willing to study it that there is not a single accident in the world, that there is nothing wrong with universal economy. We are only wrong because we destroy it, or break it, or try to escape it. And to take the human body and imagine the human body is the six billion people uh, here now or will be here in the near future. These people cannot be simply regarded as coming and going. They are not chattel. They are not merely some more to shoot. They are not more to stars. They are not more to try to sell merchandise to, even though they haven't any money. All these people are our family. They are part of a life with which we are all intimately associated. And whether regardless of what happens, all of this great group is struggling for something. But it has been deprived very largely of proper incentives because they have made a competitive, a competitive situation in which that which they strive for is not common enough for them all to have it. It is not common enough for wealth to be so distributed that it can be equally found by all. But wealth has nothing to do with survival. It has only to do with trivia. The facts of reality go deeper. Security, happiness, peace, integrity. These are the things that all nations must live for. But they're getting very bad examples. The so-called leading nations are leading the way into further armament. The great and powerful ones are leading the rest into bankruptcy, with themselves included. All these things are the wrong examples to set to a suffering world. A suffering world sees the luxuries and extravagances of some powerful state, and this in turn soon leads to warfare. All of this is settled down into a new pattern which we all have to find. If you want the body of the human being to be healthy, it must be brought into a state of cooperation among the parts of itself. The body of the individual is one organism. The social body of mankind is one organism. It has to be worked out in such a way that it will ultimately return to that which was its basic pattern, namely family. It is a set example of the simplest unity that we have, and all others are extensions or perversions of this unity. Now, one family means we've got to stop misliking everything the others do. We've got to stop thinking of, of you know, profane nations. We've got to think of you know, those who have no God and all this type of thing. We've got to bring religions together in peace and comradeship. 
we've got to find the good in those we don't understand. But we also have got to watch day and night to make sure that the relations between all human beings, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their vocation, are essentially honorable. We have an essentially honorable life. We can rebuild the golden age. The Garden of Eden is not so far away. We are messing it up pretty badly. Just imagine that this world now has destroyed, as far as its uh, surface earth is concerned, struggling with problems of petroleum, struggling with lack of water, all these things. Could become again the Garden of Eden that it was in the first place, simply by the constructive use of the resources that we possess. Well, if all our efforts to improve were devoted to making things better instead of making one nation stronger than another, we would get somewhere. But armament and war and these problems lead only gradually and more and more rapidly to the extinction of a people. So we have to go back to the idea of the mother of mysteries, the great Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. The great mother, the mother of mothers, is the great sense of maternity in deity. The, the wonderful plan of life is a great maternity. It is a great a blessing. The world we live in is a great mother, capable of protecting and bringing peace and security to all. It is forever bringing forth the harvest. It is forever bringing forth the nation. And if we use its gifts properly and wisely, it is the mother of infinite security. It is the mother of, of all things that we need. This motherhood of truth, the motherhood of wisdom, the, the motherhood of reaching out a hand to those in need. There would be need, no need for wealth or for poverty, only to work together for the greater glory, glory of truth. We are going to have to fight through this because this problem will never end until we make truth superior to avarice. It will never end until we accept the reality of the brotherhood of man and the parenthood of the divine. And until we do that, we will continue to struggle in this maze of illusion and sickness. And it is certainly hoped with great, great emphasis and, and desire that the new century that is coming will bring us a new vision of this particular point. But we have to recognize that we live in a benevolent universe and that we are making the trouble. There is no such a thing as selfishness in the stars. There is no such a thing as hate in the moons. These things arise of individuals arguing and scraping and scratching for some little privilege that they want. These people have never disciplined themselves, have never done anything worthwhile with their lives, and don't expect to. All they want to do is to be happy for a short time, and then the devil takes behind the most. This will not work, and it isn't working now. But we can make it become a basis of something in the future. But each one who gives his thought not to himself first, but to the need of all. We can, in a very short time, bring back most of the things we need. We are not both, but we're getting a little more desperate. We're getting more and more aware that uh, the bottle on which we live is getting little, is getting more empty. But with cons conservation of resources, the, the earth will last until we graduate from it if we start to learn a little. This world is a school. We must graduate to get out of it. And if we do not graduate before it is destroyed by our own selfishness, then we'll have to come back in a new pattern of the same thing and do it over again. We are going to have to be honest before we graduate. And we can never get out of this world until we graduate. <clears throat> we can lose the body, but the spirit will be the same. So, we have to realize that the great mother of mystery is, is a wonderful, tender, touching power, forever dreaming of the good of all.
forever nursing the values of existence, forever full of love for its children. But the law says it cannot take the right of that child to grow. The parents cannot suffer for the child, but it can suffer from the child. And in time and in purpose, we will finally come to the conclusion that this earth is a pretty nice place and that we can take most of the suffering out of it and out of ourselves if we will start by keeping the great rules of life which we will find in the great systems of world philosophy and religion and add to them the adaptation of modern devices and modern inventions to the great program of human redemption. If we do these things and do them thoroughly, we do long, we get along pretty well. And then, until then, we've all got to get busy working on ourselves until we make the corrections that are necessary. Thank you.